I'm hoping the Big Ten has to modify their system for us. <laughs> it's probably like getting great 10 sandpaper rubbed on your face every day. I mean, we say it all the time, whether, you know, there's two types of turds, you're a sinker or you're a floater, but you're still a turd, right? I mean, um, we're, we're, we are about players and players playing the plays and not necessarily the plays. Welcome to the Varsity Club Podcast. My name is Derek Peterson. Joining me this week, friend of the pod, KLIN's sports director, Caleb Penry. How are you, my guy? Hey, I'm good. I would really like it to not be the rainy weather it's been this week because I want yep. there to be baseball this weekend at home. But, I mean, what, what are you going to do? Just happy there's a season. I um, The funniest thing happened this afternoon. So I sold uh, two pairs of shoes. And, like, I don't know if you're in the sneaker game or not, but people care greatly about the boxes that the shoes come in. Mm -hmm. And so not only do you have to keep the shoes in really good condition, you have to keep the boxes in really good condition. And so to transport these stupid shoes to the post office to get them into a shipping (laughs) box, I had to like, and the funny part of the story is that there is somebody sitting in her car directly in front of my apartment door that is watching this whole ordeal take place. So because it's raining, I put the boxes down in front of my door walk to my car past this person that is sitting in her car, get my umbrella out, walk back to my front door, hold the umbrella over the boxes while closing and locking the door with my other hand. And then I have to like finagle my door open the car door <laughs> while keeping the boxes still dry. Right. Um, because I was a dummy and for some reason locked my car door. <laughs> and so like this whole ordeal is like way more complicated than it needs to be it takes way longer than it should have for me to just transport two stupid shoe boxes into my car and as i am pulling away i can see the person that is sitting in the car that just watched the whole thing laughing and we make eye contact <laughs> and i know it's not because of a podcast she was listening to i know it's not because of a conversation she was having with somebody on the phone i know it's because i look like a damn idiot all because it had to rain today. So I'm with you. I will say this without looking at everyone's feet, every time there's media availability, you might have the best sneaker game of Husker media. I, I, I with, a, with the exception of a couple people, I feel like it's a pretty low bar to clear, but thank you. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very low bar. I can say that for sure that it's a very low bar, but you've definitely got the best. And then uh, your cover. Aaron always has really good shoes. Yeah. She always stay, stands out with the shoes. But also, I can't wear like the yellow heels and stuff or, that she shows up in or any of the slide. Like, I, think I just you could grab pull a, those off. I think you could pull those off. I, I could try a little bit, but I'm already 6'3". I don't need to be any taller. Like, there, there's a lot of other issues. See, for me, that's a short guy. Like, If anything <laughs> that can add height to my build, I'm all about it. So with these Jordans that I've gotten into – um, there's a little, there's a little bit of a, of a midsole boost that you get. Oh, nice. Them. So nice. So I, I have like an extra inch, um, of confidence. And so for a short guy, I mean, when you're on the margins, you know, every little gain matters. This is, uh, this is the life that Nebraska has lived for the last few years. I, I can see it. And especially when we, when we're covering these football press conferences and now everything in person, I'm like, you know what? I think I kind of enjoyed these being on zoom. Cause now Ty Robinson walks out and I look super tiny. And I no yeah. longer feel good about this. <laughs> yeah, yep. He's a big dude. Um, somebody called him Ben Stilley's uh, son or Ben Stilley's twin or something the other day, and really? now I'm not going to be able to get that <laughs> image out of my head because he does with the with the shaved head. He looks a lot like Ben Stilley. I can see that, and it's going to be great that Ty's going to go. He's trying to work in pediatrics. Yeah, that is so. Very cool. Eventually, it's going to be Ben Stilley's grandkids at some doctor's office. Is, just, is the way that thing's going to go? Just imagine Ty Robinson is a huge man. He's a huge. I mean, I think he's six six. He's a huge man. He's an intimidating figure as a defensive end. Imagine that dude, and 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 I would venture to say Ty is going to be one of those guys who, after his football career, will stay in wonderful shape. So imagine that dude like doing the fish tails thing that Doctor Sam did in New Girl with mm-hmm. with your children in a pediatric hospital. I think that's a wonderful image. Here's the thing: I have a five month old. So for the last five months, we've been making regular trips to the pediatrics office. I'm now trying to imagine all of those visits with it being Ty Robinson (laughs) and not this five foot three doctor that we have. Things would be very, very different. I'd be like, yeah, let's go in there. I'm afraid, but I think it's going to be okay. (laughs) 
Yeah. Um, you are here to talk uh, spring football. Yes, uh, yes. We are going to talk a little about the running back room, a little about some injury stuff, um, and a little bit. We'll get there in a minute. But we're recording this on a Thursday night. Uh, it's 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 the evening, and sort of unfolding on the timeline uh, while we record this is just another. Um, and I can't even be delicate with it. It's a shitting the bed moment for the NCAA yes. with uh, this this women's volleyball tournament situation. Do you have thoughts on what's going on with the way that they're handling this and the way that they handle the women's basketball tournament? So, I mean, we you kind of got the idea when you saw the women's basketball tournament and they just had like the one pyramid of dumbbells and some yoga mats. And you went, all right, this is already stupid enough. And then they kind of got some things worked out and you thought maybe there's a chance for the NCAA to kind of rectify the situation going forward. And then even with the calls, including from coach cook on to re expand the tournament back to 64, those are like patently ignored. Uh, There, there was no way that they were going to go and do that. And now we're a week out. Um, It'll be less than a week when, when this drops from the tournament starting in Nebraska being into their match. And like coach cook said, they're going to, they're scheduled to practice an hour before their match. That's not a thing anybody does. They're all going to be playing like it's a 16 and under tournament at the convention center. And you can't have, they're not going to have commentators at all. It's going to be great for folks like us at KLIN that we get John Baylor and Lauren cook West. And they, they're going to call the game still over radio but there's a lot of folks want to see these and you can't be there in person. They're just, it's a failure at every single turn by the NCAA. And the reason that the sports can't grow outside of men's basketball and football is because the NCAA continues to stand in the way. And like you said, it's a shitting the bed moment because the NCAA just doesn't care. And there's nothing they can say that is going to make it seem otherwise that they care or they're ever going to care that things have got to change. I don't know if it needs to be privatized, but the NCAA is not doing it. Well, you know what they could do to show that they care? They could have prioritized this tournament. Yes. Like, we're, we're not even a month removed from the women's basketball tournament. Like, you're telling me that they didn't see everything that happened with the women's basketball tournament and think, mm, maybe we shouldn't roll this, this volleyball tournament out as is. Maybe we should try to do some tweaks before people figure out what's going on here. Like, the, the people that will sit there and yell at me and say, well, what about the revenue? What about the revenue? What about the revenue? Um, the, the UConn Baylor elite eight game in the women's basketball tournament directly competed with the Oregon state elite eight game in the men's basketball tournament. The men's game had like 5.5 million viewers or something like that. The women's game had 1.7 million viewers. So I understand there's a discrepancy in the people, the number of people that want to watch these events, but UConn Baylor, that's a a decade long record for viewership. They had 1.7 million viewers. Um, provide the sport with the necessary support. You give it equitable marketing and people will watch. Like your revenue problem might not be as big of a deal if you actually took the time and spent the resources to promote the event. ESPN built the heck out of the UConn-Iowa Sweet 16 matchup in the women's basketball tournament and that drew 1.6 million viewers. It just, it, it makes no sense to me when the NCAA treats the men's tournament like it's the World Cup and then airs a Final Four promotional video for the women's side that makes no mention of one of the four teams in the field. Oh, man, right? Like, like the NCAA's excuse for this was that they dropped the ball with the women's basketball tournament. They didn't want to pick up the ball. They didn't drop the ball. They didn't even pick up the ball. They took the responsibility of hosting these events, and then at every single turn, they have shirked on those responsibilities. Nebraska is helping. People... Uh, there were, I, I saw somebody that said that uh, Western Kentucky's broadcast team had offered to commentate games that Western Kentucky was in. People mm-hmm. on Twitter are saying, hey, I'll color commentate for you for free, which is a whole other problem that the NCAA would potentially get a service without paying for that service. <laughs> right. Like <laughs> all this time they have blamed COVID. They have blamed space. They have blamed whatever. Instead of just acknowledging what remains blatantly obvious. And that is the fact that women's sports don't matter. They don't Mm -hmm. matter to the NCAA. And 
That needs to change. Not tomorrow, not next month, not after you've put together a subcommittee to conduct a month's long review. It needs to change now. This is a mindset thing. Flip the switch or give up the position to someone else that is going to value the work that these female student athletes are putting in. And if the NCAA can't commit to an actual partnership with the group of people that they routinely take advantage of and then treat like second class citizens, then it's time for programs and conferences to start leaving. I think a really good point you made was, yes, when there was direct competition, um, the UConn game was as good as any have been for women's basketball, but it wasn't as good as the men's that day. Why is that? And the reason for that is, Derek, we grew up watching the men's basketball tournament and men's games on TV. I don't remember ever watching a women's game growing up. I don't think I remember seeing a women's game until maybe I was in high school or college. So that's only about a decade ago. And those were very few and far between. It had to be a big matchup that they suddenly put on there. Obviously, we've seen that increase a little bit over the last couple of years with WNBA, but you're going to reach a point where people, especially young girls, have grown up watching these sports. If they don't have that possibility in front of them, you can't grow that viewership down the road. Why, why is the NBA so big right now? Because you saw the, the growth worldwide there was an actual it's on effort. every single night it's yes, on tv to, every single night you had the effort to do that if there's no effort to put women's basketball or volleyball softball any of these sports that are high level athletes and especially here in the state of nebraska what you're seeing for high level athletes and especially with volleyball if you're not putting those out there you can't grow the sport and you're just handcuffing yourself at any future revenue and it's your own fault you can't point and say well, there's no revenue in it. There's no revenue because you're not trying to produce revenue. It's not something to look at the book and say, this is the revenue we can produce now in 2022 or 2023. There has to be eyeballs saying, this is what the revenue can be in 2030. You have to grow that a decade out. It's not something that's one or two years. And I, that's been painfully obvious that the NCAA just tries to look and go, these are what the numbers were. This is what they'll be next year. And that's the end of the story. They don't care and they're not going to care. And correct me if I'm wrong, they haven't, I don't think they've released like what actual revenue looks like for the women's basketball tournament. Nope. Have they? Nope. Have not. And they don't really ever disclose what like the cost is of putting on that tournament. Nope. Like it. I didn't, I didn't so much care about the, like the differences in the, the gift packages or the swag bags right. that the men got versus the women. The, the thing where it's just blatantly obvious is in the, the differences in testing protocol between mm-hmm. the, the two basketball tournaments. And then when you restrict the traveling party and you make an infant child count with the numbers, it's, it's upsetting. It's very upsetting. And I, and I imagine that, that we will continue to, to hear upsetting things. Well, unfortunately, good, that- as we get closer to this tournament. That was, that was a fun start. There's the pod. There we go. Oh, <laughs> football. We could talk football. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Um, and we really don't. I mean, we're going to open with something that is, uh, that is sort of a negative, too. We got to watch 30 minutes of spring practice, about 30 minutes of spring practice, Wednesday morning. Mm-hmm. Not enough NWA being played. Got to say that. Going to need <laughs> some more NWA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the playlist was 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 better. There wasn't. I didn't notice a ton of like heavy metal. No, like yeah, that like was that was used definitely to be. Absent. Yeah, so that was good. <laughs> that was good. Easy was in there, which was nice. Um, yeah, so we got to watch thirty minutes, and we got to see some special team stuff. We got to see some individual stuff. We got to see some um, some very interesting stretching. <laughs> One thing that everybody noticed was um, Omar Manning was not practicing. He was out mm-hmm. there, but he was not practicing. Uh, Marquis Step was out there, but he was not practicing. Uh, Nebraska's one of the prized uh, offseason additions at running back from USC. Uh, he was out there, but he was not practicing. Did not have a boot or anything um, on either of his feet. I want to make that point. Um, right. Frost said, came out and did an impromptu availability. Uh, after practice was over and said that uh, step and Ben Stilley and freshman defensive back Marcus Buford will, will all three miss the spring. Um, 
but also at the running back position, I maybe they weren't out there. Maybe I just didn't see them. I didn't see Ronald Tompkins or Savion Morrison. Mm-hmm. And Ramir Johnson was also standing with Marquis Step, not practicing. So uh, Jojo Doman was also out. Will Honus is going to be a limited participant, very limited, according to Barrett Rude this spring. Um, are you overly concerned about any of, of these injury situations? Are you overly concerned about like the the totality of this injury situation right now? The only place that I am that I have worries. And I think it was worries even without injuries is the running back room. And then you add in the USC transfer and step who's built like a bowling ball. And you expected to kind of be, take the Diedrich Mills role of here's the upperclassman who's going to get the majority of the carries while some other guys can develop behind him, And you hope some guys come along. Now he's out for the spring. No, it's, it's not games, but you want him to get reps and get into everything that's going and then some of those other guys not participating, even if that's the only practice they miss all spring, that's the one we get to see. So for, for all of our reactions to the team, it's we have a 30-minute window that bases a lot of what we take away for the next couple of weeks. Um, obviously, until uh, fans get to even be there on the 17th, which is so cool. Um, but the part that gives me a little bit of hope is how much we've heard um, both from Ryan Held and Frost talked about it a little bit, is the emergence of Gabe Irvin, how well he's run in that room. I hope he can really come along because at this point, if he's all that's really there and steps limited when we get to the fall, we're into the same situation year over year now where guys are still banged up in the backfield. And that, that's, been, that's been a problem, not just with quarterback, uh, but with running back and then whether or not guys are there for wide receiver, like Omar Manning, uh, not participating on Wednesday, we didn't really get to see him all fall. So then it was like, okay, why, why are you here again? I, I hope you're healthy, but just constantly out. But yes, the running back room, that is my biggest concern with step being out for the spring, missing out on those reps and the number of other guys not getting reps at the one time we were able to see practice. Yeah, it's, it's certainly a position to monitor. I'll play, I'll play devil's advocate a little bit on this on the step situation, and not specifically arguing you, but I mean that's been the the common theme from a lot of people that I've seen is that uh, mm-hmm. we 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 would prefer to have him available for the spring. I get that. He's he's the more experienced guy in the room. Um, two seasons with USC where he got on the field. Does the spring necessarily matter a ton for him it, in the sense of like him picking up the playbook, him being comfortable with things? Yeah, it matters in the sense of him being out there and, and being able to build up some chemistry with the rest of the offense. Yeah, it matters. Um, he's going to be back by the summertime or they expect him to be back by the summertime, expect him to be ready for preseason camp. If that is, if that does come to pass, I, I wonder if, you know, maybe it doesn't become a situation where, you know, it's similar to like what's going on with the defensive line with Ben Stilley being out, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, defensive line coach, Tony Tuioti said that the plan was to kind of limit Stilley's reps already, just because he's a sixth year senior, he's been through a bunch of stuff. They want to develop some of the other guys. If this leads to snaps um, for Irvin, for, yant in the backfield for like Savion morrison or marvin scott maybe um you're building up a little bit of depth now like no injury is a good injury you don't want to have injuries um but i didn't necessarily like hear that and think okay the sky is falling on the running back room i still i like the running back talent Mm -hmm. um and 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 i i kind of wonder too like about this Irvin stuff because it's it's similar to what we heard about Marvin Scott and then Scott right. had like 64 rushing yards total in the season and it's similar to what we heard about Ramir Johnson and or like Brody Belt that one spring and then Belt right. didn't play um we'll see i mean we'll we'll see some like it, you just have to have a special true freshman running back for him to ever actually do something um as a true freshman so we'll see the thing that was the thing that's interesting to me 
is the so the transitional period between the last coaching staff and this coaching staff after the 2017 season there was not insignificant chatter about the fact that the previous regime dealt with so many like soft tissue injuries so many like little things where guys would just miss practice guys would sit out guys weren't available this that and the other thing and it was because they weren't doing this right or this right or this right there was there was chatter and now like we get into practice and and I think it's it's a really important distinction that you that you made where you said this is one practice. This could be the one practice that a guy like Savion Morrison misses all spring or Omar Manning misses all spring. This could just be the one. And, and Frost is just super unlucky that this is the one that he gave <laughs> us. But like specifically with Manning, he's missed a lot. Mm-hmm. And then we get in there and we see like Jojo is not there. And Jojo has missed stuff in the off season because of injuries. And Will Honus is not there and he missed stuff i mean he missed the northwestern game because of injuries like it they mm-hmm. it just seems it it's not it's not alarmist levels yet but it does seem like there's there's like there's it's like something to keep in the back of your mind of like that they it continues to be a thing that like it's like oh nebraska can't have nice things guy's hurt again <laughs> this guy's hurt again he's just not available like braxton clark is going to start for the secondary and or push for a starter in the secondary. And then he gets hurt before the season. Miles farmer is going to play a big game against Purdue. And then he gets hurt in warmups. Um, Savion Morrison is getting ready to play. And then he has COVID and he's out. It's like I, it, maybe Dan BB cursed them <laughs> or maybe they're, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I can't, I can't say if there's something going on, but it's just, it's that part of it. Just, just on the whole, to continue to have some of this injury stuff. And I don't know what the answer to that is, but it is a little interesting and, and, a, and a little bit concerning. There's a couple of possibilities of things on like why guys are hurt. Well, there's one, especially if you talk to some older guys, the difference between being hurt and being injured. If, some, if somebody's hurt, you can go out and do stuff. If you're injured, obviously you can't. If, if you're hurt, find a way to be out there, but not get injured. You'll hear a lot of that from not just the older guys uh, that used to play in the program, but you hear that a lot from older folks on Twitter and social media that are just well, like, oh, just just toughen up with it. The I mean, you kind of heard it. You kind of heard it from Deontay Williams, too. Yeah. Yeah. You did. He hear was like, I wanted Deontay. to play in a bowl game. Right. And that that part. I'm not so worried about that part. We, we can get to the, that part. I'm not so concerned with Deontay's comments on it. Uh, but the other thing that the issue could be is I know there's really great training staffs at Nebraska and they like, you can go through, you've got the training tables and um, the great strength and conditioning program. At some point you're seeing a pattern of enough injuries that I don't know if they're doing some introspection introspection to see if the way that they're doing the strength and conditioning program is not helping guys stay healthy over the course of a season. And, and that's the part that definitely has me concerned because that's that's no fault of the players then on, on anything that they're doing, um, just trying to stay out there. They're just going through all the things that they're being told to do. Now, the Deontay Williams thing was talk, talking about the, the bowl game. I'm not so concerned about that because I think I just put that in the rear view mirror enough. But obviously there are the folks that are concerned about what does that say for the culture that – you would have guys vote against playing in a bowl game. I completely get that. I'm not really holding 2020 against anybody. If, if dudes like the same thing that coach Frost said, when they announced that they weren't going to be in a bowl game, like guys are tired. There were folks that hadn't seen their family in 300 some days. They had been pretty much locked down on where they were. Nebraska was one of the few programs to do really good at not having a giant outbreak of COVID. And that tells you guys weren't interacting with each other as much or interacting with their friends or people across campus as much. That's not a fun environment. The last year hasn't been fun for anyone. So I'm not going to hold anything that happened in December against anyone. I know, especially for older guys like, like Deontay, and he's coming back. He wants to get more film. Um, He wants to make the league and, and get paid and continue to play the game that he loves. But for a lot of the younger guys, they're not to that point yet. 
And for some of them, that was their first or maybe just their second time really being away from home for an extended period of time. And it was during a pandemic. So I, I'm not so worried about where the December decision stands in the entirety of what Nebraska football's culture is. Yeah, I think, you know, I think the, the line that you could draw from Deontay's comments to the culture would be to say that like, okay, Deontay wanted to play a bowl game. Markel DeSmute came up after him and said that he agreed. He wanted to play the bowl game as well. There were guys on the team that, obviously did not want to play the bowl game. That's that's why they didn't. They didn't have consensus mm-hmm. in the locker room. Um, you could look at that and, and question whether or not a decision like that created a fracture in the locker room or tested the culture. Um, perfectly fair questions to ask. But to that, I would say if there was a fracture in the locker room after that decision, I don't know that every defensive guy comes back and i think you you, maybe there would have been like a mass exodus of Mm -hmm. players maybe more so than because i I don't think we can call what what happened this past offseason a mass exodus of players a couple key guys but it wasn't a mass exodus of players um so yeah i'm with you i mean like when when the decision came out i was completely fine with it It like they they want to go home and see their families for the holidays. It's completely fine after everything that they've and, been through. And you get to go into the off season with a win. Yeah. Like exactly. there, there's not many, there's not many, not every program gets to do that, especially a program that has struggled recently, like Nebraska. They ended it. They ended the season in a place where they felt like they had, they had positive momentum moving forward. Now, if you, if you follow up that Rutgers game with like a 40 to 14 loss in a bowl game, then, you know, you've completely erased all of that. So that's a really good point as well. Um, yeah. The, the the question got asked about the the bowl decision and and I like my brain was like, are we doing this again? Are we really yeah. are we litigating this again? <laughs> um, but Deontay gave an, an interesting answer and, and Markel gave an interesting answer and I think like to to your point like everybody's moved on. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know that that will necessarily have like a a lingering effect on the team moving forward. Um, but I, I guess we'll see it. And like with the, the injury thing, I don't want to make it sound like I'm like questioning Duvall, but like, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's like, it's just keep it in the back of your mind and, and, and we'll see. Um, the, the other talking point from spring so far has been sort of an emphasis on this downhill power running game. Mm-hmm. If, well, not if, because he is with step out for spring and with some of the other guys, um, status maybe up in the air. Do you think that Nebraska can 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 create sort of this offensive identity of being a downhill running team? Because it's got to you know you've got to start developing that in the spring, right? Do you think that that yeah, that's a thing that Nebraska can actually kind of turn itself into? So, and again, the part with Step being out is the the lack of reps that he gets with a new group of guys in a new offense. Um, and it, it makes me think of Diedrich Mills, how long it took him into his first full season to actually really get acclimated and playing well. He obviously did his last few games of, uh, of 2019, but it, w- it was touch and go because he was still learning what this offense was supposed to do. Now, the transition here to being more downhill running, as long as your running backs understand where they need to go, and that's thing, those are things that the guys, even whether or not they're out there getting reps, they can see that. They can do the mental reps. They can watch all of the tape, and they can make sure they're knowing where they need to go when they do get the reps, whether it's at the start of summer or they're back right before fall camp. Because for the downhill running game, you have to have that start with your offensive line. That's been a big part of the running game that's been missing is the offensive line – pushing guys off the ball right at the point of attack. And it almost hasn't mattered who the running back has been at times. That's why the running backs ran so well last year, because there was never any room up front or the quarterbacks. I mean, and the quarterbacks would escape outside on a number of runs. That's why Luke McCaffrey and Adrian Martinez were the top two runners a year ago. It was pretty simple to see, but I think if you're trying to transition that this spring, it has to be what you're doing with your offensive line. Obviously dudes are big. You've lost a couple guys. 
um, with Farniok and Hymas. Um, and you're pretty much going to be eligibility wise, sophomores and under like across the line. That's amazing to say about any power five school. Things are just weird because of the eligibility, but you have to have that downhill running from the offensive line, regardless of who the running back's going to be behind them. I'd like them to get touches and, and learn the offense, any transitions that are coming up, but it's the offensive line that has to make that move this spring. Yeah. Um, when, when we were talking off pod about, kind of the direction that we were going to go with this. I said, one of the things is just general takeaways uh, from the piece of practice that we saw. And, and uh, you, you said that you have one that got you <laughs> laughed at on the air. So yeah. what, what let's hear it. So I don't, obviously I saw you walking around while we were up there on the balcony. I don't know if you could tell my focus was squarely on the quarterbacks for the bit that we had that, um, I don't have a camera. I'm not taking pictures or filming anything. So I could just lock in on what the quarterbacks were doing now over there. Adrian Martinez, clear number one, like that, that's no one, no one's going to be surprised by that. Like he looked fine. I did laugh that the very first pass I saw was a swing pass and it got blown up at the line of scrimmage. I was like, all right, perfect. Let's the, the one bit we get to see at the practice, but then watching the other quarterbacks throw for Logan Smothers and Heinrich Harburg, the only other two on, on scholarship. Smothers, it could just be he had a bad day, but the ball did not look – like it didn't look good coming out. He, it was, there was a lot of inaccuracy. Uh, there, there was a lot of hesitancy with finding guys, and the ball didn't look tight going downfield. Heinrich Harburg looked really on point. He has got an arm on him. He underthrew one pass down the sideline. That's a timing is when he underthrew it. Like he just needed to get rid of that ball a half second sooner. But he looked – really good to the point where today I was asked for an overreaction from the 30 minutes that we said, and we said it earlier today, we only got a 30 minute segment. So it could have been a really good day for Heinrich and a really bad day for Logan. Like those two, both of those things could be true, but we have to go with what we saw. And what I saw was Heinrich Harburg is going to make a really big push for that number two spot on the quarterback depth chart. Host of our morning show, Jack Mitchell laughed at me. We go a couple hours later voice of the Huskers, Greg Sharp, is on with us, and he says, no, Caleb's right. Harburg has all the tools right now to really push for that spot. Logan's obviously got a year, kind of, with the program. He, he traveled in the fall. Heinrich's a dude. Like, from watching him in high school, uh, coaching on the, the track team when Carney Catholic got runner-up um, the last time there was a full track season, coaching with his dad uh, with the throws there, like, he is a dude. He's got all of the genetics for it. His arm is super strong. He's really, really high IQ guy. Not to say any of those things are uh, not true about Logan Smothers, but I feel like Harburg is further along than what these coaches thought he would be after getting to campus that semester. Yep. Yep. Agree with you 100% on everything. <laughs> that was one of my takeaways from the day. I, that, yeah, exactly. Um, Peanut Houston – Ran a stop and go route. Beat he, he beat the corner and he beat the safety that were on him. And he had both guys on his hip. And Logan underthrew him. And Peanut had to stop. And it would have been a 40 something yard completion. And it was incomplete. Um Heinrich fits a little corner ball like between the sideline and his receivers over his shoulder. And I was like, Ooh, I think I think you were standing next to me at the time, and I was like, that's and we a said good that's a good ball. That's a yeah. good ball. Yep, yeah. Um, Adrian had a nice ball to Xavier Betts on a a, a post route. Betts um, looked good. He looked quick. Yeah. Harburg might have the best arm of any of their three quarterbacks. I I, I would agree with that assessment. Absolutely. I, yeah. Um, he uh, so he didn't have the numbers in his senior season. And I was out there every week, and so I had the context of, of why the numbers were a little bit down. Um, dudes were dropping balls left and right. Mm -hmm. And I had people asking me, like, why are his numbers down? Like, he should be putting up massive numbers if, if you know, we're going to take a scholarship quarterback from the state. He should be putting up massive numbers. Um, yeah, I think he's got the – I think he might have the best arm of their three scholarship quarterbacks. And, you know, like – when when he committed, I, I always kind of had this sense that the first two scholarship quarterbacks Nebraska took on the trail were runners who could throw the ball. And 
the last two that they've taken have been passers who could run the ball. Uh And I think Heinrich, like I'd agree with you that he um, maybe surprised them with the way that he came in. And uh, Mario Fedusco even kind of alluded to that a little bit when he said, yeah, he came in really clean um, from a mechanic standpoint. And it's interesting that one of the first times that they saw him throw in person was in their own facility in a Huskers uniform. Um, That's the part that makes it surprising for the coaches a little bit because they, yep. that was the weird part about the last year is that they didn't get to see guys. Yep. They still can't right now, I guess, but. And um, he, uh, you know, there's been, there's been a little bit of like writing him off already before his career even began as just a, a scholarship filler or a guy that's just kind of around to be a good story as a local quarterback. Um, that's not the case. Mm-mm. And I can tell you that he is motivated by that stuff that has been said. Um, I, I mean, I thought from the first time I saw him, like this dude, like this is a D1 power five quarterback right here Mm -hmm. um he's got the arm for it so it's interesting that we both come away from from that practice thinking like it's not outside the realm of possibility that he's the number two quarterback this year and it's not outside the realm of possibility just knowing adrian's injury history that he might start a game or two this fall as a true freshman a true true freshman technically i guess logan smothers is a true freshman just because of the eligibility but those are real things to expect the way things have gone for Nebraska's quarterbacks the last few years. Now, what's, what is a big advantage that Heinrich has that none of these other quarterbacks have had in that room? It's a guy that he, he took over the Carney Catholic quarterback position from a guy he's teammates with now, with Matt Masker, who's a walk-on. So what it, he had to learn that playbook from an upperclassman quarterback at Carney Catholic comes here, Masker just doesn't have the physical tools. He's as smart as anyone that they're going to be able to run out there. He just doesn't have the physical tools. Um, He he can get some things done for you out there, uh, a la kind of Riker Fife, but he's not the guy that you want to roll out. Uh, But he's great as a veteran to have in the program, and he brings in a guy who's been his teammate. I think that's going to help the learning the playbook part for Heinrich because he has clearly got the physical tools might want to put on like one or two more pounds because he, he still looks like that high school 100 sprinter, but man, he has got, he's got a great arm. He's super smart. If he can get the playbook down, he is a guy to watch as we go through the rest of this spring, especially when we do get to see them a little bit more in person and not just the highlight videos. Yeah. He's got, he's got athleticism to him that, that would probably surprise you if you just looked at him, hadn't watched him play and just looked at him because he's, he is so tall. Right. Um, he's got that athleticism piece. And then Adrian has been wonderful mm-hmm. um, for the young quarterbacks. And I will say too, like, like, yes, technically Logan has been here for a year longer, but his year advantage was a COVID year that didn't right. have spring ball. And then he didn't play in a game. So, yes, he's been here. He has a year advantage in the sense of like, he knows maybe how to uh, manage his time between school and football or like understands the, the schedule a little bit better. Um, But just in terms of game experience, like they're neck and neck. Right. So that'll be, I'm glad you brought that up. That'll be, that'll be an interesting one to watch. Um, I know. I know people love comparisons on guys to the nineties. Now, obviously, Scott Frost, incredibly fast. He, he was also a thrower on the track team. As the throws coach at Kearney Catholic, I tried to get Heinrich to come over and throw shot put and discus when he was there as a freshman because of how wildly athletic you could already tell he was at 14, 15 years old. That's the kind of guy who is now the freshman quarterback at Nebraska. Wildly athletic, incredibly fast, super strong arm. Like th- those are like, if you just had to pick three things and you're like, what would you want for physical attributes? That, that'd be pretty much be it. He was a gunner for them on their special teams unit at Carter yeah. Catholic. And he would, he, he would just smoke his guy getting down the field. Any other kind of general takeaways 
any any sweeping generalizations you would like to make after the 30 minutes of practice that we watched? Um, Kevin um, Suits walked out and said, they're going to win 10 games this year. Do you, do you want to go to that place as well? Mr. See, I, would, I, I wouldn't be able to go that far on the wins and losses part of things. Um, gosh, I wish I could remember the lineman. I, w- I watched the lineman just get run over, and it wasn't the pancake we saw. I saw a bunch of video on Twitter. It wasn't that one. But there, there was the drills happening at midfield, and man, I, I watched one of the offensive linemen just get dominated, and I feel better that I can't remember who it was. Now, one sweeping that I think everyone would agree with as a generalization is I never want to piss off Barrett Rude. Man, he he was right. He was right <laughs> below us, and someone was not holding a dummy right, and he about <laughs> threw all of his pad armor, whatever it was that he was just taking hits from dudes. It went over and showed showed one of the players how to hold the dummy right for their drill. And I was like, you know what? I don't want to be on his bad side. I'm glad I never lined up against him. That's not a guy I want to piss off. <laughs> he's uh, he's reserved and, and controlled when he talks to us. I, I hadn't seen that uh, from him as a coach. It was, uh, it was cool. I like those moments. <laughs> I like right. those moments. Get your butt chewed. Builds character. I mean, it it happens, but that that's one of the big things that remember. It was all of the conversation when Adrian got asked last year, well, well, "How do how do you lead?" Is it? And he gave the answer about, "Well, you don't really want to embarrass guys in front of the team. You don't want to really like yell at them." And then that became a whole conversation in itself, which was dumb, by the way. But you saw nobody batted an eye when that happened. Everyone just went. Okay, he went and corrected where it was. Now we go about our business. Like there, there wasn't anything there where you could see guys go, ah, oh, I got yelled at. Now I'm just going to give up the rest of this practice and the rest of this drill. That wasn't a thing that happened. So whatever little bit of that narrative came out from, from Adrian's answer last year, that's not there in the little bit we got to see. Yeah. I don't, I don't have anything else. Um, we got a lot of special teams. They wanted us to know that we're, that they're working on special teams. I wanted to see some field goals get lined up. I want to see how far back we're going. Well, see, they took um, they took those guys and put them outside, didn't they? I, yeah, they yeah. did. They put those guys out. Well, I, I mean, yeah, they, they normally put the kickers and the punters outside, but they also put the quarterbacks <laughs> outside, which was hilarious. And they um, put them just in right, the right spot that we couldn't see out that door. Yep. Yep. It was, it was <laughs> great. It was great. I mean, very strategic on their part. Good for them. They knew what they were doing. <laughs> so uh, you you kind of uh, referenced it in passing. Fans are going to get to go watch on April 17th uh, a full practice, I, I think. Yep, I full practice. Yeah, the, the gates will open at 1.30. I believe practice is going to run an hour and a half, two hours. It won't start till after two. Free parking, free tickets, 4,000 of them in there. That's cool because it's two weeks ahead of the spring game yep. and nobody got to go in to watch the team play all fall. Yep. And you didn't get to watch volleyball. You get to come watch uh, softball and baseball this spring. But anytime you can get fans in just to see something going, there, there's that itch that needs scratch for a lot of folks. So shouts to you guys if you're able to go see that. Uh, there's a good chance that you will know more about the team than we do. Uh, right. We'll have at least seen more of the team than we have. <laughs> so uh, I'm, we'll, we'll need to have one of you on my podcast. Um, Caleb, I'll let you go. You probably got stuff to do. Thank you for – giving us some time and, and coming back on the podcast. I always appreciate having you on. Absolutely. Anytime, man. Keep that sneaker game strong. Yeah. We will be back next week with another podcast. In the meantime, keep reading HailVarsity.com. Subscribe to the uh, the Hail Varsity network of podcasts and listen to Caleb on the radio. What's the, uh, what's the, what, I don't understand radio lingo. What's the call sign number thing? Oh, Where do people listen to you? We're, we're 1400 KLIN. Stream it online, KLIN.com. That's probably obvious to the people that listen to the radio every day. Uh, I am the, <laughs> uh, the typical millennial that does not ever turn my radio on, uh, except to sync Bluetooth to my phone. It, to it's listen. podcast life for millennials. Yeah. This is what yeah. we're doing here. Yeah, there you go. So, all right, man, thank you. And uh, thank you guys for listening each week. We'll be back next week with another podcast. Hoda Media Production.